How do we stop bleeding? How do we make a clot? How do we get rid of that clot? Why is that all important? What about all those coagulation cascades? All right, today we're gonna to take a complicated topic like bleeding, clotting, and fibrinolysis, and we're gonna make it simple. Thanks for joining us, let's get started. Welcome back to Citizen Surgeon, where we're scaling surgical education and providing you with the resources you need to be comfortable on the ward, in the ICU, and of course, to crush your exams. To all the new interns out there, all the new medical students, congratulations. It's the first step, that first time you're wearing the uh, scrubs and your badge and taking care of patients, having that responsibility for the first time. It is so awesome, you're gonna get addicted to it. And um, you know, that is like 12 years behind me, so I'm pumped for you. And I hope that the resources that I'm providing, these talks, are really helpful for gearing up and doing that boot camp and getting all the education that you need. If you haven't had a chance to subscribe, go ahead, hit the subscribe button, turn on the notifications, then you'll know when these videos are coming out. I'm trying to get them out every one to two weeks. And I'm also building a resource library at citizensurgeon.com, which is totally freely available, trying to put together some worksheets that accompany these videos. So you can definitely kind of get that information and make it stick. Some of my favorite videos and some that I've gotten the best response on so far, definitely check them out. You can check out the acute abdomen video. That's like the essence of general surgery. How do you do your pain history, your exam? Uh, what labs are you gonna get? What imaging do you need to make that final decision on whether you need to be in the operating room or not? Uh, the metabolic response to injury video has been like a crowd favorite. So definitely check that out. It makes a really complicated subject simple. Today we're gonna to do another complicated subject. This is one that I skipped over many times, and that is the bleeding and clotting cascades. Today we're gonna to do normal. In next video, we're gonna do abnormal. Now I'm gonna throw in some clinical pearls and some clinical associations so you can see why is the intrinsic cascade important? Why is the extrinsic cascade important? What does it matter if we can't form a platelet plug and uh, what are some of the body's mechanisms to get rid of that and what happens when they go wrong. So let's take a clinical vignette to get things started, get the brain kind of fired up thinking about bleeding and clotting. Um, and so how about a 35 year old female admitted to the unit in sepsis, septic shock, and you have resuscitated her. She's on multiple vasoactive medications. She's way into a resuscitation with crystalloid colloid and blood. You're trying to correct the factors and then you realize that um, she has a blue lower extremity, uh, intense abdominal pain, um, and you're noticing blood from some of her mucous membranes. There's a little bit of blood in the ET tube. What's going on with this particular patient? What coagulation cascades are activated and how would you initiate your workup and how would you initiate treatment? All right, so like we talk about in every video, why? Why is it important to know about bleeding and clotting? Well, if you're a surgeon, you should be an expert in bleeding. You have to know how you can stop bleeding. As a surgeon, a lot of times we're gonna do this with our ties or different energy devices, but there's also topical hemostatic agents and it's important to know why those work. You also wanna know why you have to worry about particular clotting disorders and how you're gonna fix those. And we'll get into that in the next talk about what clotting disorders are important and how you're gonna fix them. Today, we're gonna to get into the normal mechanisms of the clotting cascades, how to form a platelet plug, and how the body gets rid of it. And I guarantee you that's gonna be enough information, but this is gonna be a great resource for you. So the goals today on knowing bleeding, clotting, fibrinolysis are number one, to know normal. Whether we're talking about the abdominal exam video and we're talking about anatomy and what pain and referred pain to expect with particular problems, you gotta know normal. So that is really important. So here we're gonna know normal when it comes to bleeding and clotting. So the first question is, what is primary hemostasis? Next, we're gonna be confident in knowing simplified coagulation cascades. And third, we have to know fibrinolysis and clot removal. So you may be in that situation asking yourself, well, gosh, why do we bleed? All right, so we bleed either because number one, we can't tie knots or put on clips or use our energy devices, or we used our energy devices in the wrong area with the wrong size vessel, 
Or number two, we had failure of the hemostatic system. I'm gonna trust that over time, you're gonna get better at number one. And today, we're gonna focus on number two. So let's learn about the hemostatic system. There are three major headings in the hemostatic system and six little parts, okay? So each of the headings has two little parts and we're gonna go through each of these. The first one is called primary hemostasis and the two parts that make up primary hemostasis are vasoconstriction, so after you bleed, getting that vessel to constrict down so there's less flow and formation of the platelet plug. So in this very simple cartoon, I want you to see a couple of things. I want you to see that we have endothelium and around inside the blood vessel, we have platelets. Now, I don't have everything else in here. I don't have all the clotting factors, all the red blood cells, all the white blood cells, everything. I just have the important things for number one primary stasis. So visualize inside this blood vessel, you have endothelium and you have platelets. It's important to know where platelets come from and how long they last. So platelets are derived from larger cells named megakaryocytes. They last around seven to 10 days. And as far as the count, usually about 150,000 to 400,000 would be a normal count. Now, when does that become important? As a surgeon, and as a pediatric surgeon, I'm usually looking at counts and I get worried for counts below 50,000. So less than 50,000 is when you're gonna have increased bleeding after an operation or increased bleeding after trauma. And then as you get less than 20,000, that's when you can get spontaneous bleeding and, and when you get less than 5,000, that's when you get spontaneous bleeding that can be life-threatening. So think about those kind of normal levels and what you need to be worried about when you're taking a patient to the operating room. There's another factor that circulates along with the platelets that are gonna help us stop bleeding, and that's von Willebrand's factor, all right? So imagine this is floating around in your plasma right next to your platelets. As you know, von Willebrand's factor is not only circulating in the plasma, but it's also in the alpha granules of the platelets, it's also in the subendothelial matrix beneath the endothelium, and we'll point those things out. Why is von Willebrand's factor important? Well, we're gonna to get to the normal part, but to get you kind of interested, you've heard of von Willebrand's disease. Now there are three types, and I'm not gonna go into the subtypes, but there are three different types of von Willebrand's disease, and they lead to an increased risk of bleeding. And why do they do that? Well, you're gonna see that von Willebrand's factor is really important in platelet adhesion. And so if you don't have platelet adhesion, you're not gonna stop bleeding, okay? The other component where von Willebrand's factor becomes important is in something called thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, or TTP. So TTP is like the opposite, where you actually have an inability to break down these ultra-large von Willebrand's factor multimers because you're either missing or you're having this enzyme called ADAMPS13, A-D-A-M-T-S-13, uh, which is inhibited or missing. And so you end up getting a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, you get clotting and fibrin deposition in these small vessels, which usually leads to necrosis and the organ most commonly affected would be the brain. Uh, so that would be TTP. And that's two clinical scenarios why von Willebrand's factor is important. So look at our cartoon here. You can see platelets flowing through the blood vessel. We have our endothelium surrounded by von Willebrand's factor. These are the factors that are really important for primary hemostasis. And the platelet has a really important receptor called glycoprotein 1B. So let's put that on all of our platelets. Now this receptor is important for platelet adhesion. Without it, you wouldn't be able to stick to the injured vessel wall. And so let's look at what happens immediately following injury. So beneath the endothelium, you have this subendothelial matrix that's composed of fibrinogen, laminin, fibronectin, and importantly, collagen. And so when you get injury to the vessel, the first thing that happens is you get expression or exposure of endothelin-1. And when endothelin-1 is released from injured endothelium, it causes potent vasoconstriction. Now there are other factors, ATP for example, that cause vasoconstriction, but endothelin-1 helps and it's one of the most important vasoconstrictors. It decreases the diameter of that blood vessel, increasing the resistance, reducing flow so you get cessation of bleeding as fast as possible. All right, now the next thing that happens is formation of the platelet plug. 
Now, the first step is what's called platelet adhesion. So when you get the platelets that are circulating through the vessel, you have this injured endothelium, exposure of that subendothelial matrix. There are two things that happen that we're showing here. And one is you get von Willebrand's factor that attaches to that exposed collagen. And then the glycoprotein 1B receptor attaches to von Willebrand's factor. So without von Willebrand's factor, you could not have platelet adhesion. So you would bleed. And that's the first step. So vasoconstriction by release of endothelin 1 and adhesion of the platelet through one von Willebrand's factor to that exposed collagen from the injured endothelium. Now, platelet activation sets off a cascade of events. And I want you to think of this as a really dynamic process. It's not a stepwise fashion, but a lot of these things are happening at the same time. Two really important things are, number one is expression of glycoprotein 2B3A, which is the receptor on the platelet that's gonna be responsible for platelet aggregation. So that's all the platelets binding to each other to form this big platelet plug and stop the bleeding. The second is what's called platelet degranulation. So platelets have these granules. They have dense granules, alpha granules. You can see the components here. So you can see that a lot of these factors are pro-stimulatory, so they're gonna cause even more platelet degranulation and platelet adhesion. One factor I want you to pay attention to is thromboxane A2. That's produced by the platelet, and it's a target of a medical therapy. If you know it, then think about it. Do you know what medical therapy targets thromboxane A2? We're gonna talk about it a little bit later. One factor I want you to pay attention to is thromboxane A2. That is a target of a medical therapy that we'll talk about a little bit later. Can you think about what it is? All right, we'll, we'll get to it. All right, but thromboxane A2 is produced by the platelet. It is released on platelet activation and it causes more platelet activation, degranulation, and vasoconstriction to get this bleeding to stop. One other factor that is expressed or exposed uh, by the alpha granules is P-selectin. Now, if you remember and you think about your integrins and your selectins, this is gonna bind circulating white blood cells and incorporate them into the platelet plug so that can be a future kind of scaffold for wound healing. So something to think about. Another thing to think about when we're looking at our platelet plug is the connections between the platelets and that protein fibrinogen. So fibrinogen is gonna be linking these platelets together through the GB2B3A receptor. And that's important because when we talk about clotting cascades next, we're gonna to want to see that fibrinogen gets converted to fibrin and is eventually cross-linked. We're gonna talk about that so that you get a really mature platelet plug. Why is primary hemostasis important? Well, we talked about bleeding, but let's talk about a couple of therapies. So how about aspirin? Why does aspirin work for cardioprotection? Why does it cause us to bleed and ooze? Well, it does that because you get irreversible inhibition of cyclooxygenase in the platelet, all right? And if you get irreversible inhibition of cyclooxygenase, you get no thromboxing A2. So if you have no thromboxing A2, then you're not gonna have that really potent stimulator of platelet aggregation and degranulation of vasoconstriction. So that's one reason we bleed after aspirin is that we're not able to really stimulate that positive feedback loop. Another medication that you're gonna see often is clopidogrel. So clopidogrel is an antagonist to the ADP receptor on the platelet. And if you have ADP receptor inhibition, you can see that this is one of those factors that's released by platelet granules to cause further platelet aggregation and expression of that GB2B3A receptor. And if you don't have that receptor, that receptor is inhibited, you don't get platelet aggregation. So these are two medications that we're gonna see pretty often, and they are direct targets of primary hemostasis. And we've already talked about von Willebrand's disease as well as TTP, and we'll get to those a little bit deeper in the next talk on bleeding disorders. So let's get to that part you're probably most worried about, and that is all of those factors in the coagulation cascades, but we're gonna make it simple, and the whole goal of those cascades is fibrin formation. So as you've seen in the textbooks, there are two pathways. One is the extrinsic pathway, and the second is the intrinsic pathway. And the ultimate goal of these pathways is to convert fibrinogen in that immature platelet plug to fibrin.
Now there are two other names of these pathways. For the extrinsic pathway, I want you to think about that as the tissue factor pathway. We're gonna talk about what tissue factor is in a minute. The intrinsic pathway can be thought of as the contact activation pathway, all right? Now, which of these is more important? Now, they were thought to be equally important, but now we're realizing that the tissue factor pathway or the extrinsic pathway is actually more important in the hemostatic cascade. Now, part of that is thinking about which cascades are important in injury versus inflammation. So when you have injury to the endothelium, the cascade that's most frequently activated is that extrinsic cascade, the tissue factor pathway. When you have inflammation, for instance, by sepsis, you're gonna have activation of the intrinsic. So think about that in inflammation. So let's get back to our cartoon here. You got the platelets that's floating around with our von Willebrand's factor. Let's throw another factor in there, and that's factor seven, all right? So when we get injury to the vessel, we've already talked about, we get exposures that, of that subendothelial matrix, which is gonna cause the activation of platelets, aggregation. But we're also gonna see something else. So factor seven, which is circulating, is gonna go and attach to something called tissue factor. Now tissue factor is a protein that's naturally expressed on cells like fibroblasts, leukocytes, and when your injury happens, tissue factor is expressed, factor seven leaves the circulation, binds to tissue factor, and that's gonna be the big stimulus for the extrinsic cascade as we'll see. So a central component of both clotting cascades is factor 10 as you're gonna see in a minute. And here in the extrinsic system, when you get tissue factor and factor seven together, factor seven is activated, and that's gonna cause activation of 10 to 10A. And that's gonna have a bunch of downstream effects. 10A is gonna combine with its cofactor 5A. That's gonna convert prothrombin or th factor two to thrombin, and that's gonna stimulate fibrinogen to convert to fibrin. Now, two other things happen. Well, it's probably a billion things happen, but a couple of things to keep in mind that makes it a little bit more complicated is after you get thrombin, thrombin is also gonna generate a bunch of positive feedback loops. So thrombin is going to stimulate factor eight, so we've heard of factor eight deficiency, and factor five. Factor eight is gonna go and, and join with factor 9A, which is gonna form this complex called the 10ACE complex. Anytime we have ACE, we wanna think of enzymes. So 10ACE, which is factor eight and factor nine, are gonna stimulate more conversion of 10 to 10A, and that's gonna go further downstream to produce more thrombin from prothrombin and fibrin from fibrinogen. So just think about that. After you get tissue factor to seven, seven goes to seven A, 10 goes to 10 A, 10 A is gonna stimulate prothrombin to thrombin, fibrinogen to fibrin. Thrombin is a massive stimulator of the coagulation process, and this is gonna create more factor five, factor eight, which goes back and feeds through the loop again for more clotting. To finish off that clotting process, you have one more factor, factor 13, and factor 13 is going to create cross-linked fibrin so you have a mature platelet plug. So a couple of things to keep in mind which are clinically important is uh, there are lo a lot of cofactors present in the clotting process. One of those cofactors is vitamin K. And so you have some factors of the clotting cascade that are entirely dependent on vitamin K. So we think of those as factor 2, which is prothrombin, factor 7, factor 9, and factor 10. So without vitamin K, you have a vitamin K deficiency. Those factors are not gonna be able to be activated, and so that's why you're gonna have more bleeding with vitamin K deficiency. And since factor 10 is so integral in both coagulation cascades, that's why this is really important. So let's talk about the intrinsic pathway. So the intrinsic pathway, or the contact activation pathway, is thought to be a little bit less important. The reason is, is that because patients that have a factor 12 deficiency or a deficiency of their calocrines or pre-calocrines pre don't have bleeding disorders. So that's why this is thought to be a little bit less important when it comes to bleeding and why the extrinsic or the tissue factor pathway is more important. Okay, but let's go through this for the sake of completion. So when you get that vessel injury, get exposure to collagen, and that's gonna form this complex. This complex is gonna be with pre-calocrine, high molecular weight calocrines, and factor 12. 
Factor 12 is gonna stimulate 11 to 11A, 9 to 9A, and then that's gonna feed right back into your 10 to 10A process. So you can see that 10 is really critical in both coagulation cascades, but here in the intrinsic or the contact activation pathway, you can see that after you get vessel injury, which is predominantly here through inflammation, you get buildup of this complex with the calocrines and factor 12, which then goes on through factor 11, nine, and then eventually 10 to stimulate the rest of the clotted cascade. So again, why is this important? We like to do that. So when we're looking at measuring a patient's ability to clot, we look at things like the PTT and the PT or the INR. And so the INR or the prothrombin time is a great measurement of the extrinsic system. And it helps to know how you actually do the INR test. How you do the INR test is you take a sample of plasma and you add tissue factor to it, and then you see how long it takes to clot. So you're adding tissue factor, which you can see is the main stimulator of the extrinsic system or the tissue factor pathway, and that's how we measure the INR. Now, in order to measure the intrinsic pathway or looking at the PTT, you take that plasma and you add an activator to it like silica, and then you measure the time to clot. So when we look at the PTT, that is usually elevated when you add an inhibitor like heparin, okay? We can talk about how heparin works in a little bit. So in order to have a normal PTT, you have to have the presence of a bunch of factors. So factors one, factors two, factors five, and factors eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. Let's say you have an elevated PTT, what could that mean? So one of the studies they do, and maybe you'll see this in the lab results, is what's called a mixing study. So they take the plasma from the patient, then they mix it with a normal plasma, okay? So let's say that you have heparin in your sample, or you have antiphosphate lipid antibody in your sample, which is gonna cause an increased PTT in both, okay? So if you mix your patient's plasma with a normal plasma in the presence of antiphospholipid lipid antibodies or heparin, you're still gonna have an increased PTT. So that's called a mixing study. In the occasion that let's say you have a deficiency, so let's say you have a deficiency of factor nine or factor 10, 11, or 12, and you mix that with normal plasma, that's gonna correct the PTT because you're providing that factor that's present. So that's one of the ways that we can see uh, is the PTT elevated because we have an inhibitor in the system or are we missing something? So that's why it's important to know about these coagulation cascades. You have the INR, the PT for the extrinsic pathway, tissue factors used to do that sample, and the intrinsic pathway, we use the PTT. Other things like deficiencies, which we'll talk about more in depth in the next talk, is factor nine and factor eight deficiency. But also, which is kind of cool, is you've heard of like quick clock. So quick clock or combat gauze, is a basically a topical gauze that can stop coagulation. We have a lot of hemostatic agents that we use, for instance, gel foam or Surgisil. We can talk about how each of those things work and why they work, but quick clot is basically factor 12. And when you have factor 12, that's gonna cause that intrinsic pathway to get into action and start the clock. So quick clot is an example of a hemostatic agent that is, um, totally a great example of stimulating these coagulation cascades. And finally, we have to talk about that third component of coagulation, which is actually clot removal. And this is fibrinolysis. And so let's talk about that third segment, and that's fibrinolysis or fibrin removal. And this has two parts to it. So one is cleavage of fibrin. So remember, fibrin is what's cross-linked in our platelet plug to make it really strong. So we wanna cleave that to get rid of the clot. And the second part is the dissolution of the clot. And so I'm a visual learner, I love cartoons, so I made a little cartoon here. So think about we have our platelets that are all bound together through our cross-linked fibrin. We have some white blood cells in there through that P-selectin that was expressed by the alpha granules. But there's something else that's incorporated in the clot. You know what that is? It has to do with fibrinolysis. Well, that's plasminogen, so let's add that here. So you got your plasminogen, these little green diamonds. So fibrinolysis is the activation of this plasminogen to plasmin. And plasmin then starts to break down fibrinogen into fibrin degradation products. Okay, so how does that happen? Well, the two stimulators of 
plasminogen conversion to plasmin are TPA, and we know that we have a medical therapy, our clot buster, tissue plasminogen activator, and urokinase. Now, if you can think about it, the platelet plug has all this stuff in it. You got your platelets, the GB2BA joining those together through cross-linked fibrin. We've trapped some white blood cells. We've trapped some plasminogen. And now we have our damaged endothelium. Now the damaged endothelium is gonna release TPA. Now it releases TPA slowly. And that's a, even at the beginning as you're forming your platelet plug. Now what happens is when you get slow release of TPA from the damaged endothelium, you're gonna get slow conversion of plasminogen to plasma. And that's gonna cause cleavage of fibrin and eventual dissolution of the clot. Now you have to have fibrinolysis or else we would just clot and occlude all our blood vessels after injury. But we gotta get rid of that clot so we can have flow. So that's why this is really important. So I'm gonna throw one more why in here before we finish. So why are fibrin degradation products important? Can you think of one really important fibrin degradation product? Well, that's your D-dimer. So what is your D-dimer? So the D-dimer is a small protein that's formed during fibrinolysis. And the reason it's called a D-dimer is that it's two D fragments of fibrin that are joined by a crosslink. So if you're having clotting, so for example, a patient with a DVT, a pulmonary embolus, or in disseminated intravascular coagulation, you're gonna have an increase in your D-dimer level. Now, while a zero D-dimer level basically rules out any thrombosis, if there's an increased level, you start to have to ask in your question, why is this increased? Why do I have fibrinolysis in this particular patient? Is there a clot? Is something happening? Interestingly, when it comes to COVID-19, if you have a fourfold increase in your D-dimer level, that's a strong predictor of mortality. So let's summarize this up. And when we look at hemostasis, I want you to think of three parts. You have primary hemostasis, that's gonna be vasoconstriction, think of adothelin one from the injured endothelium. Formation of your platelet plug. So I want you to think of exposed collagen, the subendothelial matrix, GB1B, platelet activation, degranulation, the GB2B3A receptor, all that aggregation with the fibrinogen, plasminogen, white cells all together with cross-linked fibrin in this platelet plug. Then you also have two, which is fibrin formation. So fibrin formation has those two cascades. So we talked about the extrinsic cascade or the tissue factor pathway, typically seen in injury, okay? or the intrinsic cascade or the contact activation pathway, which we see in inflammation. The end result of both of those pathways is the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. There are a lot of cofactors, calcium, vitamin K, all those factors involved, but the important thing is when we look at it, we have the extrinsic system, the end intrinsic system, and finally we have fibrin removal or fibrinolysis and that's where you get plasmin developed from plasminogen. Now that is stimulated by the slow release of TPA from injured endothelium, activating that plasmin that's already present in the platelet plug. That's gonna cause cleavage of fibrin and eventual clot dissolution. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that today. That was a really heavy talk, bleeding. I mean, there is a lot going on. If you like that, share this with your friends. Go ahead, hit the subscribe button, turn on your notifications. We're gonna have a video coming out every week to two weeks. I'm also building up this resources on citizensurgeon.com, so go ahead and check that out. We have a bunch of other videos, a couple of my favorites. Check out the best books in surgery. That's one where I've kind of, I've bought hundreds of books over the years. And those are my nine favorite books. Also, if you wanna be an expert in doing your abdominal exam, check out my talk on the acute abdomen. In the next talk, we're gonna be talking about bleeding disorders, and you're gonna be able to put the information you learned today to good use. All right, good luck, stay safe and healthy.